Hi, everyone, and welcome to Lurking for Legends, a live video cast where we talk with people from all walks of the publishing industry. I'm Christy Stratus, historical suspense and historical fantasy author, and my awesome co-hosts are epic fantasy author Richard H. Stevens and science fiction author David M. Kelly. So Lurking for Legends is an interactive broadcast, and we encourage viewers to chime in with any questions you may have for our guests when she comes on or comment on what you hear in the show. So we are back from our Christmas break. Happy New Year, everyone. Yeah, We're really happy, happy to be here. Happy New Year. Big Happy New Year. So what is up with everyone? We've had two weeks to do things. It had better be impressive. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We all relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> what did you guys do? <laughs> what has been going on in your worlds? Well, Dave, you've got some exciting news that's not really on a writing front, although this might become your writing buddy. Yeah, well, um, we kind of acquired a dog over Christmas. Well, just before New Year. Uh, so kind of. Bought a collie. Um, I've forgotten now what it is. Pyrenean Mountain Dog Cross. <laughs> yes. So, just and, dog uh, for sure. Yeah, just dog. <laughs> He's called Bingo, <laughs> and uh, we uh, so far he's uh, getting under the feet a lot, basically. <laughs> I think that's our job, yeah. Yeah, that's a dog. Yeah, that's a dog's life. Yeah. Other than that, writing wise, I've been uh, well, uh, my first reader, thank you, has uh, returned my manuscript to me with thumbs up. And lots and lots of red ink. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually um, a good thing, though, right? Yeah, that is a good thing. They're finding so, stuff that you're going to correct, so that's good. Yeah, yes. exactly. So uh, I'm now starting to work through that again for my uh, third, yeah, third pass. Uh, and I'm also continuing writing other things as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, still pushing along full steam ahead. I've got a deadline to get it to my uh, external editor in early February. And so hopefully we'll be looking for a release around March. Awesome. So am I the only one that when I read my edit or when edit my book like the third or fourth time that it takes so long to get through it just because it's like, Oh my God! I've <laughs> I've read this over and over and over again. Oh and it yeah, just, yeah, yeah. This seems so yeah. boring now, and you know it's not boring, but it's just oh, because you're just going through line by line trying to find stuff. It's no, by by the time I get to the end of, of everything, it's like I literally don't want to see the book ever again. Exactly. Yes, okay, <laughs> not the only one. It's like no, I've seen this enough now. Yeah. What about you, Christy? What's new with you? Well, I uh, crossed 300 likes on Corrupted Magic on Kindle Vela, nice. which is really exciting. That was faster than expected, so very cool. Um, episode 24 just published, and that one is called Ripple Effect. And I can't tell you too much about it because I don't want to give you any spoilers. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of sound like a broken record, but it's a very exciting episode. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, we're still in this like mini climax before the, the real climax comes in. So um, anyway, yeah, I'm currently writing episode 31. So I am awesome. still wow. way ahead. Really happy with that. Um, you know, I need that time sometimes, especially when I run into little tricky things. Like a lot of the time when I write my first draft, I write garbage and it's really just to figure out what on earth is going to happen <laughs> i'm trying to see what everyone has to say and then i clean it up so um you know i've been going through one of those for a few days now um and i'm sure i think i'm almost at the end of episode 31 so then i'll be able to clean it up and make it all nice so that yeah i think that's mostly what i've been doing with in terms of writing how about and you, you have you do have a, a an angle christy an angle yeah you you know where the, where you're going to end yeah, 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 yeah. So I have, right. yeah, which doesn't always happen, but I do have an idea of where I'm going with it. So, cool. um, you know, that's farther ahead than usual when I do mm. my novels, which is the nice thing. You know, it's, mm. it's kind of like Vela has changed my process a little bit, which is actually really good. So I had an angle, at least. I just didn't <laughs> know how to get there. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. How about you, Richard? Uh, so I've been doing a little bit of writing over the Christmas break. Not a lot. Uh, but I wanted to, uh, first of all, start this uh, show off uh, before we bring in our guest, Esther, that uh, you know, I want to thank Christy and Dave for being with me for 
uh, coming up on our 100th episode on January, or actually it's February 7th is our 100th episode, but uh, I couldn't have done it without you two. Uh, this is an idea I've had a couple of years ago, and I'm you know, a little bashful about uh, going and appearing live, but uh, it's something I've always wanted to do. And then uh, Dave is so supportive at the beginning, and then Christy, you jumped right in there, and uh, uh, both of you have been amazing co-hosts, so thank you both for doing this. Uh, but uh, I want to let everybody know, uh, if you tune in even after the fact, that uh, Lurking for Legends is going to be changing its format uh, after February 7th. Uh, so we've, we're going to be interviewing about four more authors after Esther. And then uh, we're going to be appearing monthly, the second Tuesday of every month. And we're going to be doing exclusively live reads with uh, various authors of any genre. And if you are an author and you want to appear on our live reads, uh, contact Christy, David, or myself and uh, let us know, and we will gladly get you in there. We generally take two authors plus one of us every month, and uh, we look forward to doing them. They're a lot of fun. We have a, you know, Dave's costumes are so zany, and Christy's got some awesome classical costumes, and the accents that you two uh, come up with are uh, certainly memorable. So again, thank you both for making Lurking for Legends memorable for me. I really appreciate uh, Every, all the work that you guys have done behind the scenes and uh, certainly on screen as well. So this to let everybody know that's what's happening with Lurking for Legends uh, in 2023. Yep. So the seventh, uh, the 100th episode, we are actually doing the opening scene from The Importance of Being Earnest, which uh, should have some nice costumes and <laughs> other things. Yeah, so, no, it sounds good. Looking forward to it. So we'll, we'll let everybody know a little bit more about it as, as the weeks go on and uh, mm -hmm. as we build up to February 7th. But until then, I think uh, we have someone uh, waiting in the backgrounds, uh, yes. Yes, Esther Ehrman, and I'm going to bring her on screen. And uh, Christy, I'll let you introduce her. Yes, we are super excited to have historical novelist Esther Ehrman. And she has written the book, Rebecca of no, Salerno. Esther. So good to have you here, Esther. Yeah, it's a beautiful oh, awesome. book. Isn't that gorgeous? Mm -hmm. My goodness. Great cover. So tell us a little bit about yourself just to start with. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me and Happy New Year to everyone. Um, I'm a writer. I was a longtime language teacher. I currently live in the Bay Area in California, but I consider myself from New Jersey. Um, yeah. And I... Um, I was uh, very excited to, um, this book is something that's been brewing for a long time uh, mm -hmm. because um, in school, I was a French major. I have my BA and MA in French and I always loved French literature, but as a Jewish woman, I had to compartmentalize because any Jewish characters that showed up in the classic French literature were villains. Not that there were many of them, but they were all bad. And um, when I did my doctorate in language education, I did a survey of Jewish characters in literature, which is when I discovered Walter Scott's Ivanhoe from 1820. And uh, he created the character of Rebecca which in itself is a fascinating um, genesis, but um, she was the first positive Jewish character in certainly major European literature. And um, she does set a high bar for Jewish women, I have to say that, you know, she's mm. beautiful, she's brilliant, and she's brave and she's a good daughter, uh, but she came as a breath of fresh air uh, for me after all the negative characters. Uh, and I wanted to give her her own story, um, which um, being in Ivanhoe, Rebecca was a healer. And I decided this was a key to her character. So when I discovered that there was a medical school in Salerno, in the kingdom of Sicily, where men, women, Jews, Christians, and Muslims could study together, I said, aha. That is what Rebecca is going to want to do after she flees England and doesn't get over Ivanhoe. Mm. That's fantastic. And Already, I mean, the school was real. Mm. Oh, yeah. Uh, quite amazing. Also, I've just discovered it was actually the first medical school in Europe and possibly in the world. Mm. Wow. 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 That's amazing. Oh and uh, this is, um, well, Ivanhoe was medieval, and of course, my book continues in the medieval era. 
Yeah. Was that uh, research rather difficult? I mean, I know that you had Ivanhoe for like a start, starting point, but then you're doing mm -hmm. research so far into the past. Um, you know, how, how, how did you find the research? It, it's actually fascinating. Um, and part of it is that you don't really get a solid uh, response to how did this medical school start? Uh, there are some legends um, about it evidently started around the year 802. And uh, the, so the story of the founding sounds almost like a joke. It's a Greek, a Latin, a Jew, and a Muslim all get together. And it sounds like, yeah, they're going to go into the bar <laughs> and um, have a good time. But um, evidently one of them was injured and then the others kind of joined in and started a medical school, which may or may not have been connected to a monastery. Uh, but this is legend, and um, that's about as, as clear as the foundation of this school gets to be. Um, so it's, it's been interesting, uh, fascinating, and there are so many aspects to life that you can spend time on and decide you know, what you're interested in. So food, for me, is an interest, and so I spent a lot of time looking at that. Um, and, and just the history of the era, because so many things were uh, coming together, really made it fascinating to look at. Mm. I second food, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we always have this image of them just having terrible food. But in fact, yeah. um, in the Kingdom of Sicily at the time, they probably had fresher, better food than some of us get to enjoy these days. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I, I just want to ask you before we get more into uh, Rebecca, is that uh, I, I saw on your website that uh, you also uh, have written a story for uh, a fundraiser for Ukraine uh, called The Art in the Time of Unbearable Crisis. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to touch a little bit on that before we uh, get back into Rebecca, because I, I think that's a, a, worth, a worthwhile uh, thing to speak about and certainly something very current. Yeah, that's um, my publisher, She Writes Press put together the anthology and they, they did pretty quickly to raise money um, for Ukraine. And, um, you know, at the time they thought, oh, well, this is, might be just a short event and maybe by the time the book comes out, it won't even be relevant. Um, and unfortunately we know this is, the war itself is ongoing. Um, I came from a refugee family myself um, and um, I can vouch for the fact that all those refugees have a long time that uh, even after the war ends, there's going to be a long healing process and a long need uh, for support um, for the people. So um, I wrote a personal story about um, my maternal grandmother who, um, and in the story, she, um, she was uh, living in Poland as a very um, religious Jewish woman uh, back in the days when people had arranged marriages. Hmm. So uh, she, as a young woman, fell in love with someone and um, his family asked for a dowry. Um, the, his, her father said, if I have to pay a dowry, you're going to marry a scholar. That was more... Uh, um, prestigious and long story short, she, they got married, they had two children together. He went to Jerusalem, he came back to Poland and said, yeah, let's all leave. She basically said no um, and ended up um, through a series of things, marrying her first choice as her second husband. Okay, which was sounds like a very romantic love story. Uh, my mother was born from the second marriage of both of her parents. Unfortunately, my grandmother ended up in a gas chamber oh. and oh, nice. it's kind of the uh, result of a decision made from love mm -hmm. uh, and one would wish for better results when people are making those difficult decisions, which is takes me right back to Ukraine mm -hmm. where people are having to make those really, really difficult decisions. So anyway, that's the genesis of, um, of that. And um, I wish this need didn't exist today, but yeah, for these, sure. these, these stories keep cycling 
No, that's that's awesome that you uh, shared that information because uh, you know sometimes those personal stories can be very painful and hard to share. But uh, so, how how's the fundraiser going? Is it uh, how's how's the book making out? Uh, that I really don't know. We don't have too much, uh, you know, not privy too much to that. So I'd have to ask my right. publisher. Mm -hmm. I hope they're making a lot. And yes, um, so that's for sure. Yeah, and uh, well, I hope in the new year the war ends and at mm -hmm. least we get to a different phase of. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this so, is one of the reasons I um, also identified with Rebecca, because mm -hmm. um, as David might remember, uh, at the end of Ivanhoe, she was almost burned at the stake mm -hmm. as a healer, and also because the wrong man fell in love with her. Mm -hmm. um, and Ivanhoe came and rescued her. There was a duel, and um, she was saved. But at that point, her father and she decided it's a good time to leave England. Mm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> when they went south as refugees, and then, of course, she discovers Salerno in, in my sequel. Mm. So just uh, going back to that, um, Esther, do we know anything about kind of like uh, Walter Scott's original kind of inspiration for creating Rebecca? Because, she, as you say, she is a very, very unusual character for the time that that book was written. This is actually fascinating, and it's a, a yet another history. So there was a woman um, in America named Rebecca Gratz. And if you live in the Philadelphia area, you might be familiar with Gratz College and, and the family that was pretty prominent there. So they were members. Of, she was born right after the revolution in, the US, in America and lived till about the Civil War. Um, she was from a very prosperous, uh, cultured, educated family um, that were, lived in the Philadelphia area. And um, she actually um, was pretty faithful to her Jewish religion. She came from a large family where about half of the people intermarried. Um, and she evidently had a, a relationship with a Christian man whom she decided not to marry. So she stayed single. And she was very philanthropic and um, generous. So she became involved with helping to take care of a woman who had an illness and the woman died. This woman's fiance was Washington Irving, the writer. Mm -hmm. And Washington Irving was just so taken with Rebecca Gratz, even though he was brokenhearted over losing his fiance, he went to Europe and evidently he hung out with Walter Scott. Huh. So yeah. there is a very strong temptation to say, oh, Rebecca Gratz was the source of Walter Scott's Rebecca. But this has never been definitively proven. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. evidently um, Rebecca Gratz read Ivanhoe and loved it. And people said, oh, were you the model for Rebecca? And she coyly did not respond. Uh -huh. so, um, <laughs> I think if someone was able to actually um, prove this connection, that would be a real mm -hmm. clue. <laughs> that would be really something. Wow. Yeah. I mean, um, that... but, um, other than that, it's really hard to imagine. Mm -hmm. um, where did Rebecca come from? Mm -hmm. How did he come up with this marvelous character? Well, I think the way social media is going now, if, I, if we say it enough, uh, that that's proof enough. Like facts start falling through yeah. facts, <laughs> and everyone will start believing it. So we just have to keep saying it through social media, and all of a sudden, that'll be the next move. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds great, but um, yeah, yeah. just missing that <laughs> link. <laughs> I also on your website, I said you, you do a lot of appearances too uh, with this one book, and that's amazing. Uh, you had a lot of appearances last year, and the one that intrigued me the most was the one back in August called Books and Bagels. Like, how could you not have a better event than Books and Bagels? As long <laughs> as you don't get grease on your book pages, but. <laughs> Well, that it's it's funny that you mentioned that. That was my launch, and that was a lot of fun. But I, I'm like going it. to segue from that to one that I hope is coming up this week. We're due for some awful weather here, which I hope doesn't happen. But um, there is a group in San Francisco of Italian-American sportsmen, and they have a lunch 
where they invite speakers. Cool. Uh, and they are fascinated with this whole medical school at Salerno nice. and want to learn yeah. about that and about the culture. And um, you might wonder how, in fact, I came to the attention of this group, which is that actually tomorrow my freshman year college roommate is due to arrive here and she is connected to the group in San Francisco. So mm -hmm. she was going to come visit me. She said, hey, you know, let's go have lunch there because they have these nice lunches mm -hmm. and they have speakers. And then I guess she told them about my book. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, That's meant so to that be. Is, uh, yeah. Uh, unique. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish you luck with that. That sounds better. fun. Yeah. <laughs> So um, in your book, Rebecca has a servant, Nina. So what is the relationship between them? And what about the other women in the book? Okay, well, Nina um, becomes, um, what happens is that uh, Rebecca inherits the house and Nina from uh, relatives of a relative, which is how she's kind of also able to be in Salerno. And Rebecca is a mother figure. She's very, uh, in addition to preparing wonderful food and taking care of things, she also uh, takes the place of um, Rebecca's ancient mother. Um, now in Ivanhoe, again, it was just Rebecca and her father, Isaac. So mm -hmm. from there, I posit that mom was gone early uh, mm -hmm. in life. And, and there is a gap there. The um, other women also say, hey, you know what? You never had a mother, you never had a sister. You know, you need to get this kind of advice and caring that you don't get even from a, a, just having a devoted father take care of you. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so the, the other women definitely play um, an important role um, um, in the book. Um, and, uh, but also, um, there's, the, well, one of the offstage women who plays an important role was Eleanor of Aquitaine. Um, going back to um, Ivanhoe um, and the setup for what happens for Rebecca, um, Ivanhoe had followed Richard the Lionheart to the Crusades and um, they were coming back uh, and this really happened in, um, in history. Uh, Richard was kidnapped by the Hohenstaufens and held prisoner. Mm -hmm. Now, in his absence, his worthless, horrible brother, King John, who later ended up having to sign the Magna Carta, um, had taken the role of king and also refused to pay the ransom uh, for mm -hmm. his brother. Okay. Uh, their mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine, was the one who intervened and had the ransom paid so that Richard was freed from this prison. Now, how this connects to my book is that the Hohenstaufens um, and uh, the Holy Roman Emperor took the funds and conquered the kingdom of Sicily, which is where Salerno was. Mm. So, um, and what happened with that is, is that we were talking about the very tolerant medical school that Rebecca chose to go to. When the Hohenstaufens came in and conquered the ruling Normans, the whole atmosphere of tolerance began to go downhill oh. and deteriorate. So, you know, there's a real overlap between the, that history and um, and then what happens in the book. Mm. Um, from a historical perspective, I mean, it has to be said that Jewish people like get such a bad rap, don't they? I mean, like whenever we see them historically, like you said, like you mentioned that they're, they're almost always the villains or, I mean, in Ivanhoe, uh, Rebecca's father, he's a money lender. It's like how many times, yeah. uh, Jewish people, you know, seen as moneylenders in like everything from Ivanhoe to Shakespeare and everything kind of in between. And it's like, yeah, I mean, what what's with that? I mean, I, I've never been able to kind of like understand it 
myself and and <laughs> but it's like it just seems to be this thing that's been there f for you know forever almost sort of thing yeah. um so i mean how does how does your story kind of fit in with that do you think uh yeah um well often uh, the situation was that uh working with money was the only kind of work that was available for mm. Jews in different areas. And um, they were closed out of other uh, professions and guilds. And this is again why the medical school was tempting. Uh, and you know, when you were financing or collecting taxes or other jobs like this, this could tend to make you not be so popular. Mm. Uh, but um, and and then you know go in with this so often actually the jews ended up financing the uh uh historical um e events that went against them mm -hmm. um and and that harmed them the crusades and so on uh and uh where you know whole towns were massacred so um, it's it's part of that complexity, but the money lending was often closed to Christians, or they couldn't charge interest, and so on. Oh, so this okay. is where the Jews did the work they could. Hmm. Oh. Interesting. And that's simplifying something that's really pretty complex. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm not no. sure if you this. Yes, we'll read it. We'll read it out. Thank you so okay. much for this question, JD. Uh, he's asking, not sure if you covered this, but how long was the research? And did you outline everything methodically or as you went? So this is such a very good question. And I gather that the other writers here are also pantsers. Yeah. As opposed to yeah. plotters. Yeah, I'm, I'm a pantser too. So saying if anything I do is methodical. A discovery <laughs> writer, I think, is the politically correct way to say it now. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, discovery is, is writer, wish, yes. Yeah, is wishful thinking. Um, <laughs> you know, like kind it. of you have a rough roadmap that you have as to where you want to start and maybe end and hope, you know, and start going there. So, um, yeah, it was just a very, very long process, uh, but calling it methodical would be um, complimentary. <laughs> You're a hybrid. I wish I could be. I wish I could be more of a plotter because I understand uh, plotters do fewer drafts. Mm. I don't know yeah. about that. They, I think they I'm take a dancer and I don't do a lot of drafts. I do one draft and I just edit and I'm good to go. But I edit as I go and I edit after I go. I, I think as a fantasy author, because I have a long series that I have start as a pantser. All my books are pantser beginnings, but... Uh, there's a lot of plotting that goes on as the books go on because I have to start documenting my history. So mm -hmm. as much yeah. as you research the history of, you know, Jewish history and everything else that you went into uh, Salerno and Rebecca, I, I have to research my own history, which, which seems kind of silly, but uh, it's true. I have to know exactly what's happened gone before. So I have these extensive uh, Excel spreadsheets. So I'm kind of a hybrid now as well, just because mm -hmm. of uh, the way my pantsing a career has gone on. So 14 books into it, there's no way I can remember what happened in book one. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Especially yeah, if you're, if you're working on a series. Um, yeah. I, um, I consider literally my first draft, I call it the vomit method. You just kind of <laughs> 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 not to dignify that, um, you know, as uh, calling it a draft and a lot of editing, a lot of revision, a lot of editing for sure. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So would you say like, uh, I know that JD was asking a little bit about, you know, how long was the research? Would you say that you did like a ton of research first or did you t sort of do your vomit draft, realize what you had to research and kind of did the majority after? Um, I think the, the original research and the original inspiration was finding out about Salerno. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then as you go along, you, um, you say, okay, yeah, I need some, you know, work on this and I need to know some more about this. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so no, all the initial, the research was not done initially. Um, I, I, I did it as I went along. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard it's to know cool. everything you got to know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden you realize, oh, my gosh, you know, um, you know, about this or about that. And mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, there's missing stuff. Part of what um, the year that you know, the book takes place is 1205, which was right after the death of Maimonides, who is a very important um, figure in Jewish history, was a great scientist and also a great writer uh, about a lot, very, very prolific. Um, and so, you know, finding out more about that, and um, mm. that was one aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, I think, Richard, you wanted to say something else. No, you know what? I've uh, totally lost it, but I think you've answered the question anyway as you went on. But, uh, <laughs> that happens all the time. Just, just gone. I know. Yeah. Oh, you know what? But I, what I, I did want to talk about uh, is I want to hear about your massive book collection. About? Your massive book collection. Oh. <laughs> I have a great big library. I've got finally old enough to have mm. my own room dedicated library. And I actually yeah. built a secret library. Yeah. So you actually move one of the panels and you actually walk uh -huh. into where I uh -huh. keep all my manuscripts. But I love hearing about other people's libraries. Yeah. Um, well, um, I have a lot of books. Um, and I'm happy that I'm not limited to one language because that means yes, I can wow. have books in more than one language. And um uh, having them, yeah, I have too many books. No, um, no, 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 never, never. <laughs> it's, it's impossible. It's uh, impossible. I, guess I have what, not enough space. <laughs> yeah, there is space could be an issue for sure. And it's funny. I do these book fine. shows, and people say, "Oh, I, I like the guy get a book, but I have too many books mm -hmm. already." I said, "No, no, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Buy a book. You don't have enough yet." <laughs> So, yeah. as, Esther, you mentioned uh, languages just then, and uh, it's like I noticed on, on your website, it mentions that you're an expert linguist. So I was kind of like curious. It's like, have you done any translation of like your own book? Um, no, um, I haven't. Um, and no, for one thing, um, if you're going to translate, as far as I'm concerned, you should be translating into your native language, not yeah. from it. Mm. Um, it, it's um, translation is so difficult um, to get right, and you really have to be current in the language that you're translating into, which is pretty much impossible if you're not living in that country and using that language. Mm. So, um, no, beyond a, a very primitive level, uh, I wouldn't be doing that. Um, but in my book, I had um, Raphael, who is the sort of love interest. He loves her, but she doesn't love him, at least. Um, working as a translator mm. and uh, trying uh, to keep the Hebrew language alive, uh, mm. which actually was a real thing. And uh, so what Raphael does is that he takes um, the current knowledge such as what is being created by the Arabs and the Jews in medicine and so on, and translates it into Hebrew in an effort to keep the Hebrew language contemporary and current with uh, what was going on then. And, um, and this really was something that people were doing. So um, you know, the idea is that Hebrew was dead for all those centuries, but actually it wasn't as dead uh, as people would assume, you know, so it wasn't just brought to life all of a sudden when um, uh, when is, when people started uh, going to Israel to Palestine. Um, but um, in in the book, also, um, what happens is um, Raphael and Rebecca get caught up in trying to solve a murder, mm. uh, and. Um, a rabbi who comes from Maimonides' court in um, in Egypt is accused of murdering a crusader, which is not something that goes over big for the Jewish community. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Rebecca and Raphael become very involved in pursuing justice. Um, the rabbi is not a popular figure, mm -hmm. but they don't want him to be executed for a crime he didn't commit. Mm. This is all part of really how it actually got pretty complicated. Um, you know, we tend to look back at medieval and think, well, things were simple. They weren't. Right. Mm. That's true. 
And this all had to do then with going along with the deterioration of um, the tolerance in um, Salerno in the Kingdom of Sicily. Mm. We have another question from JD and he says, how many languages do you read and write? You read and write, okay. Um, <laughs> that's an interesting question. My first language was Yiddish, which is written in Hebrew characters. Um, I abandoned Yiddish when I learned English at age five. Um, so very late, I've been trying to pick it up. My parents always spoke Yiddish to me and I always responded in English and kind of typical immigrant families. Um, the language that I am theoretically most fluent in other than English is French because I have my master's degree. And so that's considered in theory that you're um, fluent. Though I'm feeling very rusty because I haven't used it, although I'm doing Wordle now in French. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and I'm also doing Wordle in Spanish, which I've studied a lot less, but I do better in the Spanish than in the French. Um, I, my parents spoke Polish as the secret language in our family. So in an attempt to understand that, I studied Russian in college. So that's a different alphabet. Um, and, uh, and I learned that as a non-native speaker for Polish, I didn't understand much of it from the Russian. But now I'm studying Polish on Duolingo and finding some of the Russian helps. Ah, OK. And I also um, studied a little bit of Italian, which is absolutely gorgeous, beautiful, beautiful mm -hmm. language. I wish I had studied more younger. <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe you could read some of the uh, older documents, antique. Yeah. Documents. Yeah. I mean, Latin too. I mean, gorgeous, gorgeous sounding mm -hmm. language. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I studied um, Latin in grade 10, so I don't know a lot about it. But I actually have a couple of characters named after some Latin character people that you read in your first reader, you know, Loquax and Fellas and Bregans, they're all, they were Latin names that uh, made it into my very first book, which I thought was kind of cool. But mm -hmm. yes. So uh, JD is asking a uh, first book that really left a mark on you. That's always an interesting. This question. is an interesting question too. Um, the first book that I recall, it was a library book and it was called Heroes and Heroines for Boys and Girls. And it had a great cover. And the character I remember from that is Joan of Arc, who totally mm -hmm. just captured my imagination. Um, mm -hmm. And, and um, so to the point that I majored in French. So how old were you when you read that book? Seven. Wow. Oh, wow. And awesome. uh, Joan of Arc just, uh, I mean, I'm still fascinated by Joan of Arc and I'm way past seven. Um, so yeah, that was absolutely, um, the, the first book that I recall that really just impressed me so much. Um, I used to, I lived in the Bronx at that point when I was little and, uh, my, I remember my mother would give me a dime and I would go to the corner store and they had all these comic books, you know, and I would spend hours, I think, I don't know how the owner didn't throw me out of the store, you know, trying to choose which comic book you know, to buy for my dime. Um, another book I just want to mention as a French major, um, the most perfect novel that I ever read was Les Liaisons Dangereuses by Laclos from 18th century. So I'm just going to give mm -hmm. him a plug. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure you appreciate it. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, this is, you know, talk about a one hit wonder, but what a perfect, <laughs> you know, technically just the most perfect book. Yeah, what is that in English? Um, dangerous a, liaison. A, da, da, dangerous liaison. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Which yeah. has you know spawned plays and movies mm. and all kinds of things. Really, yeah. um, it's an epistolary novel. It's all written in um, letters, and he just gets, gets it right. <laughs> so anyway, someone's looking for a good book to read. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Really cool. Hmm. Do we have time for one more question? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think okay. there was another one about Joan of Arc that I saw. Or... Oh, no, JD was just saying that, uh, you're saying that it's a fascinating subject. And, yes. But he also mentioned something a little bit earlier. He said, uh, uh, 
look at clothes and tell me how simple the middle were the middle ages <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you know the middle ages you know and it's funny too because um actually when when the medical school school started 802 is often considered the dark ages um so some mm. people just figure medieval lasts 500 to 1500 um in the common era other people say well you know 500 approximately to 1000 was the dark ages and you know calling something the dark ages makes it really sound simple and primitive and all that and none of it was mm. yeah uh, it's very interesting uh, from a scientific point of view because i mean the dark ages is kind of like considered this kind of like time period where like really nothing happens sort nothing of scientific happened. and and all of this kind of stuff there was no progress but in actual fact it's it was the dark ages because they weren't the records weren't kept and that's what makes it kind of like dark because it's not known what was happening but uh yeah it's kind of like strange how these words get conjured up isn't it yeah yeah i have all the, these monks you know hand copying mm. um everything and, and and you know the the records like that but like i said the medical school started in 802 which is really it's considered ninth century but you could almost push it eighth century and um you had Charlemagne, Charlemagne becoming the Holy Roman Emperor mm. in 800, uh, you know, and starting that whole uh, tradition that lasted until I think it was 18, 1811, 18, you know, uh, was um, uh, who, the last Habsburg who mm. then uh, gave it up. So it was, you know, we're talking a thousand year tradition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it all started then. So Francis, mm. Francis II, who became Francis I, was the last Habsburg Holy Roman Emperor. Charlemagne, Charlemagne was the first. And, you know, just contextualizing when that medical school began. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. It amazes me, that, like you were saying before, about what was available and what they actually had during different time periods, because my time period is the Victorian era. And even then, I'm still surprised sometimes by the things it turns out that they had available things. Yeah. That you, just, you just don't think that they did, you know, it's weird. <laughs> sometimes so, it's um, pictured differently. Yeah. They, you know, they were, they evidently had enough transmission of the ancient Greek medical stuff that yeah. started the medicine, but then you had all the, um, the Muslim conquests, around the Mediterranean and their medical work um, and the Jews who worked with them. Um, so you had a, an amalgam of the old and the new, you know, coming mm -hmm. together and pushing ahead and making something new. And then, of course, eventually leading to the Renaissance and, um, and all that. That's awesome. Yeah. But, you know, we could talk about uh, history all the time you know, for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> it's so interesting. And even through the dark ages, there were things to talk about. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to say thank you for coming on our show today. And uh, we mm -hmm. really appreciate having you here. Uh, so, what's next for Esther? Are, are you doing something? Are you writing another book? Are you hooked now that you've got the one story in anthology? And <laughs> well, it's funny because there, there are a few different directions to go in. I mean, Rebecca Gratz is a fascinating character. Mm -hmm. um, there are also, I've discovered there are so many lost characters. Um, there is, I don't know if you all know uh, that there in last February, a statue of a woman named Licaricia was unveiled in Winchester, England. And she was a Jewish financier from 13th century who lived in Winchester. Uh, was married twice. And among other things, she helped fund the Westminster Abbey. Hmm. Uh, and King Henry III, who, um, with whom she, she worked in finance and so on, got involved in a Jewish religious court that was necessary for a Jewish divorce so that she could marry the second husband she wanted to marry. <laughs> oh, I like that. And if someone said, wow, was there ever an a, a English king who intervened in a Jewish divorce court? You say, really? You know, it sounds like fiction. It wasn't. Um, <laughs> so I'd love to uncover some of these stories that are lost yes. and, and bring them out because they're fascinating. 
definitely. Uh, you, you and Christy need to work together here. You guys can probably. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. Christy does. Christy does that as well. She finds all these uh, unheralded characters in history mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. and brings them to life. And it's, it's, their stories are so interesting. You, you wonder why we've never heard about them before. It's one of my yeah. favorite. One of my favorite things is discovering these forgotten people who were a really big deal in their time and just just dropped off after that. Nobody's ever heard of them again. I love. Yeah, well, love they that. uncovered enough of this story to put up this statue. Um, yeah. In yeah. Winchester, England, and um, wow, you know. So yeah, you do wonder who whose story haven't we heard, and um, and how do we find them? So yeah, mm -hmm. I'm choosing amongst these different projects. And oh boy, it's before we uh, let you go, uh, where can we find your books? Um, my books are available in um, any bookstore, uh, any brick, brick and mortar bookstore, and on all the different uh, online uh, sources. So you're not exclusive to Amazon, you're on uh, Apple and all yeah. those other places too? Okay, yeah, awesome. it's all those places and, um, and, sure. and, and, you can, you know, order them in bookstores mm -hmm. in the U.S. and in England. Oh, that's <laughs> oh. awesome. <laughs> and, you know, I was in England in October, and I went into the bookstore, and I ordered my book, and it was there the next day, and I said, wow. Wow, that's cool. That's yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah, this really is so neat how fast we can get stuff now. Like, yeah. I was doing I was doing a book show, and I ran out of a, my first in series and one of my series, and I oh, great. You know, I got two days to get it. And so I figured oh, I'm going to go on Amazon. I ordered on Amazon. It was there the next day. Like, mm -hmm. so it had to go to some kind of printer. They had to actually print it, get it yeah. to Amazon and then send it to me. And I had it the next day in my hands. I go, Holy cow, it was crazy. But the price wasn't cheap, but at least I had them for the show. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so anyway, thank you for uh, coming on, uh, Esther. We appreciate you mm -hmm. sharing you. Uh, oh. your story. It sounds very interesting. And I love the historical uh, history, uh, historical yeah. Historical history? <laughs> yeah. I'll be okay. I'm Thank stuff, you I'm so still much. recovering from New Year's. <laughs> Thank you, Esther. Yeah, thanks, Esther. So next week's guest is young adult science fiction author George Sirwa. George is the author of the international best-selling young adult science fiction novel Excelsior. So that kind of goes along with our uh, line there. So would that be in the Dark Ages, Excelsior? <laughs> if theoretically it was around. He has served as president of the Missouri Writers Guild and is the host of two podcasts. George is also an audio audiobook narrator, so it'll be interesting speaking to George next week. So for Christy, Esther, Dave, and myself, we wish everyone a safe and happy week ahead. Until we meet again, take good care. Good night.